My guest on this episode of Living Peace Podcast is J. Kim Wright. Kim Wright is an internationally recognized pioneer in the field of integrative law and is the author of two books, Lawyers as Peacemakers and Lawyers as Changemakers, the Global Integrative Law Movement. Kim Wright is also a TEDx speaker and teaches and writes globally on transforming the practice of law. You can learn more about J. Kim Wright at www.jkimwright.com. Kim Wright, welcome to Living Peace Podcast. Thanks for having me. It's fun to be here. Wonderful. So, you know, I, I was reading your, um, uh, your biography in preparation for, for our interview today and some of the things that you have written. And the first thing that I'm wondering is, if someone says to you, Kim, who are you? Uh, or you need to introduce yourself at a cocktail party or just anywhere, what do you say? What I usually do is I first ask them about themselves. <laughs> <laughs> because then I know what part of me to introduce to them. Right. So um, if I were at a cocktail party of a lot of mediators, I could say that I've been a, uh, a mediator since um, the mid '90s, and that I've been a proponent of mediation. I've taught mediation, and mm. I could say something like that. If if they're doing collaborative law, well, I was one of the early adopters of um, of collaborative law, and I actually also an early adapter of it. And um, and I teach that all over the world, and this particularly right now, I'm working with a group in Spain that is taking collaborative practice and putting it in. Um, a lot of different places, and it's funded by the government. Hmm. Um, if I'm talking to somebody who um, is centered on family, I will say that I raised 16 children, and um, and that I did that while going to law school. I had seven when I went to law school, um, but I didn't birth them all. I um, am one of those mother hens that takes in all of the little chicks that are not um, that are not finding their place somewhere else, and I have very big wings. And I've never had more than eight children live with me at once, and most of them were teenagers. Um, but I have a very big uh, family that I, I love and I'm close to, and I have um, seven great-grandchildren. Wow. <laughs> so, um, and I'm only 60. Mm. Uh, and so uh, if, I, if somebody's talking about travel, I can say I've, um, I've been to only 22 countries but that I uh, have created deep relationships in about half of those. And I keep returning over and over and adding a country um, every year. And um, then depending on what else they ask me, I, I can probably have, um, have different threads of my life. I mean, I've been a taxi driver and I've been a lawyer arguing jurisdictional uh, issues in front of courts. And uh, I've been a peacemaker, and I've been a coach, and I um, have a habit of creating websites and catalyzing groups, and so a lot of things. Hmm. It's amazing, you know, the more, uh, the more we expand in our lives, um, the less uh, one descriptor, one definition um, feels accurate or applicable. Uh, or, 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 or sufficient um, to really describe what we are. And it seems like any definition, um, much less so, defines us. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't fit in the box. And right. it doesn't really matter what your box is. <laughs> right. Well, I, 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 and I think you, you and I are on the same page in that we've probably decided to give up boxes. Um, it's more, the li life is more expansive without them. Why, have, why even have boxes? Well, and every once in a while I have to fill out a form. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's always a challenge because that's sort of like trying to put me in the box of their blanks. Right. And so things that would be really easy for some people to answer I have to actually have more context for. So I've been a nomad for, for over 10 years now, and I have an address that is my home address, and I have an address where it is my business address, and then there's the issue of where am I at the moment. Um, mm. If you're going to send me something, then you want to send it to where I am. And mm. so something that's really basic 
where most people fill out their name and address um, actually requires thought. Um, mm. but, but that's consciousness. You know, that's, <laughs> that's an awareness of, uh, of, okay, you know, I need to know the bigger picture so that I can um, speak to this particular question effectively. Right, right. Well, of course, one, uh, one of the ways you do describe yourself in something that has played a really, really um, important role in, in everything that, that, that you do in, in, in your very, very expansive work um, is that title uh, of a peacemaker. So I am wondering what, what, does, it, what does being a peacemaker mean to you? Well, it actually is more of an inquiry. I, I was practicing law mm-hmm. in um, the mid-90s, and I, I knew that uh, litigation wasn't going to work out for me. I'm actually a really good litigator. I am strategic, and uh, I, but I'm not mean. Mm-hmm. And I, I, you know, grant dignity to everyone. But the uh, even in cases where the the case came out in favor of my client, mm-hmm. uh, my client said, "I never want to do that again." I, I, there was one particular case uh, where my client, who was the best mother. I have ever known and I'm kind of like on that scale of mothering right she mm-hmm. was the best mother she would do anything for her children and um, she, uh, at the end of her case she had custody of her children and and you know had prevailed and she said if I ever have to go to court again I'm going to give up my children mm-hmm. and so I knew that as you know I'm good and I can I can do this and I, you know, there's part, a part of me that really enjoys the game of it, but it's not a game when you're dealing with real people. Mm-hmm. And so I was working with a, a, a life purpose coach and I came up with that. I w- that my life purpose was in peacemaking. And then I, you know, was like, I'm a lawyer. Mm-hmm. How do I be a peacemaker and a lawyer? And how do I, create a practice and a, and a system that allows that. So that was sort of the genesis of my work. Mm-hmm. Uh, looking to see, you know, how could I, how could I shift my practice and then the whole system so that people who wanted to make peace had a place and a way to do it. Well, and how did you? Well, I wrote a couple of books about that. Uh, <laughs> That's why I'm asking. <laughs> Uh, Lawyers as Peacemakers is, is one of the books. And, um, and I, I started connecting with other people. So I know you interviewed Stu Webb. Mm-hmm. And so in the mid-90s, I connected with Stu. I had been introduced to the concept of actually being a peacemaker by a man called Forrest Baird, who is from Chicago. He's not with us any longer. Um, but um, I, I had two role models to start inquiring with and to start designing a practice in a place where everybody else thought peacemaking was not the way to go. And, um, and so I started reaching out to people and they reached back. It was kind of, it's kind of like nobody had asked mm-hmm. for them to actually come and sit at a table together. But the idea of coming and sitting at a table together was a good one. And so we started, um, I started doing things like that. And I started being known as the lawyer who would not go to court unless I was going to win. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, um, and so like, I, I had one client who was a, a great example of somebody who um, most lawyers would have taken to battle, mm-hmm. and, um, and he would have lost. Mm-hmm. Uh, he, was, um, he was not a good guy when I got him. But I, I treated him as a whole human being, and he, um, he quit drinking, he quit being violent. Um, he actually um, spent nine months um, for being violent against his mother-in-law. And, um, and you know, we, we, we worked together because he told me his goal was to have joint custody of his son, and that that was never going to happen unless he got that in court. And so I had the conversation with him, well, who do you need to be? And how can we help you become that? And he actually 
over the course of over a year, maybe almost two years of, um, before our, the trial date came along. Uh, you know, one of those great things about trial is that they don't happen as fast as they do on TV. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time he went to court, he actually was somebody who was awarded joint custody. Mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, I kept looking for, if I'm a peacemaker, what do I do in this case? And what do I do in this case? And I kept training myself and doing my own work to kind of um, get in touch with that um, fighter who wanted to do that knee jerk fighting and to, and to um, delve into well, what, what might be more effective here. And, um, and so as I did that and um, pretty soon uh, there were a lot of people in my community who wanted to practice that way or, you know, would come and we had a very collegial um, family bar and uh, I, uh, I created friendships. I wasn't from there and you know, I was in the South and I was in a small town and I wasn't from there. Mm -hmm. uh, so I immediately as an outsider was suspect mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, the, I created friendships so that lawyers would actually, they would come by my office at the end of the day they just happened to be walking from the courthouse and one came in one day and said, did Bob come in here? I thought I saw Bob come in. Bob who? Well, you know, Bob. And it turned out that he just wanted to sit and talk, but he kind of needed an excuse. <laughs> and pretty soon at the end of many days, I would have two or three lawyers that were having kind of like a little support group and, you know, coaching session, if you will. So here I was a new lawyer, new in town, and doing things really differently. And I found that lawyers were attracted to it, even if they were a little afraid of it. Mm -hmm. And as things, things actually went really well. I, I practiced um, in that particular town for five years. And by the time I left, I had one of the most successful practices in town. And it was a more peacemaking practice, definitely a holistic practice. I had uh, a social worker um, in my office, uh, counselor, I had law students coming and leading support groups. I, I, had, um, I had, had a full staff of people who were busy all the time because we had a lot of, a lot of cases, which uh, you know, was one of the measures of a successful practice. Another measure is that my folks um, either didn't go to court at all, or if they went to court, it was dignified and it was um, not attacking. And, um, and the cases sometimes settled in the middle or the, they prevailed. Mm -hmm. So, so um, one of the things I said is that if I can do this here in the middle of rural South, it can be done anywhere. Mm -hmm. And um, after, after that few years of that practice, I had the opportunity to test that because I was married at the time and my husband got transferred to Portland, Oregon. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I went out there and uh, and started uh, started collecting the lessons and putting them out on the web, which was new. This is uh, in 2000. Uh, the web was pretty new, hard to believe now. And uh, I started putting that out there, and I started reaching out to other lawyers and learning from them. And then I worked for a while as a mediator out there. And you know, one thing has led to another. And I've, I've created a community that inquires into this. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's not like there is an answer or a religion of peacemaking. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, there, there are a lot of people who are trying a lot of things and let's, let's all share and see what we can learn from each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and, and staying with, with, with the theme of inquiry, uh, I've, I've been inquiring a lot, uh, you know, if we could discern some qualities, uh, and I think you alluded to some of them, of what makes, of what makes a peacemaker. I think that it, there's a certain level of personal awareness is a requirement. Mm -hmm and personal inquiry you mm -hmm. might you might call it consciousness mm -hmm. um but uh, some people are more comfortable with the term awareness mm -hmm. 
And that when you have an awareness of what's going on and how you check, then you can start to ascertain why other people are doing the things they're doing. And you can have compassion and empathy and, and those other things that make for peacemaking. Uh -huh. um, and so compassion, empathy, self-awareness, um, willingness. Um, because uh, there, there are probably some things I'm not willing to be peaceful about. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, you know, you mess with my kids, um, you know, you pour toxic waste in my water, you know, I'm, I'm going to uh, activate that part of me that can be um, a warrior and, mm -hmm. you know, go to battle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, hmm. I think, um, that's, that's at least the beginning. I'm sure I can think of some more. Right. Well, I think what I'm hearing as, as, as really, uh, because at least three, three of the elements you identified were elements that arise from within us. Mm -hmm. that, that, that peacemaking is really not um, a matter of title, a matter of, uh, you know, what's, what's on your uh, name tag, uh, what, or what training you went to, uh, but, but rather it is something that is um, arising from within us. And, and from that, um, the conclusion that I would draw is that if it is something that arises from within us, it then translates into everything that we do. I think, um, I think there's some merit to that. And, and, it, and there's also a trap in that. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> well, I, I, I remember that um, I, so I was in the middle of a divorce when I met a particular friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And she was a confidant of sort of the, the, uh, the stuff that didn't make it into the public, mm -hmm. um, which I think is an important important thing. I, I have supported a lot of people who need a place to vent the stuff that is uh, in the way of being who they want to be in the world. You know, mm -hmm. that the human of us arises and we, you know, we're mad and we want to, you know, hurt people and all that. And the difference is, do we have a place to put that and sort that out or are we going to act on it? And, um, and so this, this friend of mine who, um, actually she's not a friend anymore, but um, that, you know, is part of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me. And so um, she, um, when I wrote Lawyers as Peacemaker, she actually came to the book launch and, uh, and said I couldn't possibly be a peacemaker because she knew that I had a lot of conflict in my life. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And it's sort of like, you know, you put the flag up and say peacemaker. Um, it, um, it invites somebody to, um, to judge you uh -huh. and to find you wanting uh, instead of to, um, to give compassion, empathy, um, and space to the human uh, that has all of the feelings and then transforms those or transcends them. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And so I, you know, it's like saying you're conscious or enlightened, you mm -hmm. know, <laughs> those are dangerous words, but, but if you're just living that way, right. And not, you know, putting the flag up, I think, uh, I think it's, uh, it's a, uh, a safer space. Right. Right. And, and something that I alluded to before, uh, before we can't came on live, um, hanging out, you know, you and I kind of hang out in, in some of the same communities and, and, and hanging out in some of these communities, mediators, collaborative lawyers, wonderful people. Um, but what I'm beginning to experience is that the word peacemaker uh, is, 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 be, is beginning to be a little bit dogmatic, um, sometimes in the way that is used. And, and, and this is, as you mentioned, you know, kind of putting out a flag, I'm a peacemaker, and what I am seeing sometimes that that to people means something very, very particular, you know, that they 
have a very particular practice that, that, that does very specific things, uh, sometimes I'm not sure how much internal work, you know, there's, there, there's really go, go going on. Um, and then it becomes a means of excluding other people. Uh, where we say, well, we, I'm a peacemaker. Well, that's it. I, I, you know, I, if my litigator friend calls me to lunch, I don't want to talk to him because we are now on different planets. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm wondering if you have any, if you observed that and if you have any, uh, any comments, any thoughts on that? Well, I just wrote an article for a professional journal on uh, a topic really similar to this. And um, maybe, maybe you know, Henry, um, I need to explain it for the listeners anyway, but have you ever heard of spiral dynamics? Yes. So I, I, I'm, I spoke at a spiral dynamics conference mm -hmm. and I um, have been working <coughs> with um, several people and we've been looking at spiral dynamics and the, and the legal profession. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And spiral dynamics um, came, came from psychology. There was a um, professor called Claire Graves in New York who did experiments with people, uh, you know, like tests and, and all that kind of stuff, you know, the kind of the psychological research that one does. Um, and discovered that there were different value systems. And the value systems came from life conditions. Mm -hmm. So for example, if you are living on the street and um, are uh, you know, looking for your survival mm -hmm. um, every day, you're gonna have a different value system than somebody who has a, you know, a, a cushy life, literally on a cushion, meditating all day. Mm -hmm. the, the life conditions are different. And so different life conditions give you your values. So if we, you know, we're not in the same place, but if we suddenly had a tsunami that wiped out the East Coast, mm -hmm. um, suddenly people who, you know, were sitting on those cushions would drop into survival. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like the life conditions would be drastically different. Now they might find their way out of survival faster than somebody who'd been in survival their whole life. Mm -hmm. so, each level of these um, um, it, uh, has a lot to do with simplicity and complexity and, and, and awareness. And so what, I, what I've learned is that these value systems actually do have different definitions for peacemaker or mm -hmm. mediator, uh, the role of the lawyer. And, and, and so my article was about looking at um, the spiral dynamics um, structure and how, how a peacemaker would look like, for example. Mm -hmm. And so um, some people, um, the Spiral Dynamics uses colors, and so the survival level is beige. They, they're meaningless colors that were just picked out of a hat so that they mm -hmm. could talk about them. Mm -hmm. um, beige is all about the, you know, so just surviving. And it's become really relevant because of our opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are living in survival who look like they're living a normal life, mm -hmm. but they're really looking for their next fix. Um, and so there's a lot, a lot of that going on in the world. But then there's also um, the next level up is purple. Mm -hmm. And purple is about belonging to a tribe. Mm -hmm. and, and it's, uh, um, and, you know, we all have a little bit of all of these. For me, purple is really mm -hmm. uh, really a strong one because it's family oriented. And for me, the world is my family, mm -hmm. uh, but it's, it's that family orientation. And so um, purple peacemakers would be sort of like tribal elders sitting in a circle saying, you know, everyone has a chance to talk and we're going to find a way to, um, to take any wrongs and we're going to uh, be able to reincorporate you into the society. Now, the next level up is one that we're seeing a lot more lately, um, which is red. And red is uh, all about me and my power and my aggression and my um, territory and taking territory. Mm -hmm. And so the, um, the values are, are about uh, always being strong and never showing weakness. 
and the language of each of these is that. And so a peacemaker in, in red would actually be someone who was weak and not respected in the community. Mm -hmm. um, then I, I'm not going to go through all of them, but I'll do one more. The next level up is called blue, and blue is law and order. Mm -hmm. So a peacemaker in blue would have a lot of rules. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the rules would tell you exactly what you're supposed to do. And, and the way you would be a peacemaker is you would follow this checklist. Mm -hmm. If the checklist said, be empathetic, then you would take a moment and you would look at the person and you would say, oh, I really feel you. And then you would check the box. <laughs> mm -hmm. And you would do the next, the next thing. It's not a holistic process. It's a rules-based process. Mm -hmm. And then you know, in other levels, there are more holistic approaches, but they're all different value systems. And people, when they, when they say to you, uh, this is the way you must be a peacemaker, they're actually telling you what their value system is. Right. And then you can, and then you can speak to them in their value system rather than uh, imposing your own. Right. And if I may, Kim, uh, just to take this uh, one step further, uh, because I think that brings us to the conversation of how do we move from being peacemakers to change makers, and other uh, and, and, and uh, some, some, something also very important uh, in your writing and, and, and something you speak quite a, quite a lot about. But what's arising for me is this: uh, so values, as you say, are based on our condi conditions and conditioning. Uh, but then, if we expand to the next level, to the next layer, we're getting, as I see it, to the level of needs. And while we may have different values, we can use the color system, um, and, and the values are based on our different conditions and conditioning, once we start getting to the level of the needs, the difference disappears. So, for example, and, and I actually think our, our needs are connected with our chakras, connected, connected with our energetic body. So, for example, we all have a need, which I tie to, 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 to the seventh chakra, to the third eye, need for expansion and meaning. Tying to our heart chakra, we have a need for connection. And that goes deeper than just a sense of belonging to a tribe, but this is a connection on, yeah, both connect, a connection that is vertical and connection that is horizontal. So I am wondering if you have any thoughts on that, and then if you feel that if we can expand beyond the, uh, the conditions and conditioning, then something like being a peacemaker could be more inclusive and could allow us to really become change makers, to start changing some of the conditioning that has been set for years that conditions people within certain professions, certain groups, Etc. Etc. To act a certain way um, in the context of peacemaking. So I don't know. This is kind of a long question. I don't know if it yeah, makes and, sense. And, 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 there, and there are many parts of it. So I'm going to go and yeah. and, um, and answer the part about peacemaker to change maker, and maybe I'll hit some of the others. And whatever I've left out, you can ask me about. Okay. Fair enough. Um, so I I have um, been studying folks uh, because there, there seems to be this movement uh, where it's not just me who, you know, decided to be a peacemaker, mm -hmm. that it was, I always cons considered it was like there was all this popcorn around the world and the, um, the heat rose and it started popping mm -hmm. and, um, and people popped in different places and, and different ways. And um, they called themselves different things. Uh, but there was a commonality that um, that I've sometimes written about, but it's sort of that um, like hard to describe mm -hmm. sense of 
in interconnectedness. Mm-hmm. You know, interconnectedness is probably my um, my one word that seems to capture it in my value system. Mm-hmm. And so, um, so one of the things that I saw made the difference is that. Um, it was pretty lonely to be a peacemaker mm-hmm. um, among people who diminished peacemakers or didn't see the value. And, um, and so my work has been in connecting them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so that's why I travel around the world. It's not just that I'm um, a gypsy or a, a hobo or, you know, any of the other words that people sometimes use to describe me that, are not necessarily pleasant words. Um, peripatetic is my favorite. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not even sure I know what that means. I didn't until I started doing it. <laughs> right, 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 right. But I, uh, I, um, I have been connecting all of these peacemakers. Mm-hmm. And, and when we are in community, we have courage. Mm-hmm. And we know that we are not alone. Mm-hmm. And that even if I'm the only one in my rural community, I know that I am connected mm-hmm. to hundreds and maybe thousands of others who are having these same conversations around the world. Mm-hmm. When, I ha- when, when I have that backing, mm-hmm. when I know that these people will be there, if I call them up and say, I just tried something and I just fell right on my face, that there's somebody to talk to mm-hmm. or somebody's being mean to me and I just need to say how it's feeling right now, or, mm-hmm. or I'm going to, I'm going to go for something. You know, some of my community members have become judges and, and are, um, you know, in other positions of, uh, of influence and power. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and so having that sense of community, actually allows the peacemakers to begin changing the system mm-hmm. and um and having that uh support of community to um to move beyond their own comfort zones which you know we have pretty broad comfort zones to be able to become peacemakers in the first place mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. One, once we are uh you know connected to each other in a sort of a 3d way it's like like People say, it's like I've known them forever. <laughs> but it's, it, um, and, it, and it is because they, they maybe have known each other forever, but they didn't know each other in this, in this world. And so we've connected um, this group around the world, and, um, and, um, and now we're starting to change systems. Mm-hmm. So uh, one of the things we talked about earlier, and I'll mention, is that um, so? I, I look for how can we have these conversations uh, in places that would make a difference, mm-hmm. and um, the American Bar Association is one of those places that I think it could make a difference. And so it's why I I allowed them to publish both my books. They actually came to me and asked me to write each of them. Mm-hmm. And um, if I wanted to be a bestseller on the New York Times list, having the ABA publish my book was not something Mm -hmm. that I was going to do, (laughs) right? Right. But, but um, to be a bestseller among lawyers was going to make the difference I wanted to make. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so then I, uh, I've been joining committees and I'm a member of the section on dispute resolution. Mm -hmm. And the um, the executive director of that section is my friend, Linda Seeley. Mm -hmm. Linda and I go way, way back. And uh, so we started talking about how could we bring some of the, um, lessons that we've learned to the ABA. And uh, we've created a relational practices task force. Mm -hmm. And the task force is a very active task force. And um, we've been writing articles and we've been uh, uh, doing presentations and uh, we um, are doing the uh, telesummit. Actually, they now, they told me it markets better as a summit um, for relational practices that will um, air in September. Mm-hmm. And that summit is about how do you be relational, like from a place of strength and power, mm-hmm. not from that place of weakness. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and how, you know, lawyers have been taught to be transactional. 
-hmm. You've been taught that you're my client and I, you're at a distance. And um, I need to keep professional distance. And I need to, um, you know, I need to use technology to manage your stuff so that it doesn't get near me. And, um, you know, uh, the, you know, the more cases I can run through my practice, the more money I'm going to make. And, you know, there are all these lessons out there about how client, you know, and some of them not overt, but they're there. Mm -hmm. um, the clients are just, you know, uh, like scanning at the grocery store, next, 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 you know, mm -hmm. or, um, uh, but uh, they're really people. Mm -hmm. I discovered in my practice. And we're really people. And lawyers are pretty miserable because we've cut off the human part of ourselves and we've cut off the human part of our clients. And how can we be more relational and, um, and you know, still not be overwhelmed, you know, still take care of ourselves, you know, still be aware of things like vicarious trauma and how, you know, how do, how do we... How do we do that kind of work um, as, as a healthy person and and uh, with healthy clients? And so the relational practice task force is inquiring into those, and we're um, presenting um, our uh, our program in uh, in September. Um, that's available to the whole ABA um, mm -hmm. as a way of um, of kind of planting the seeds and. Um, and overcoming the enculturation that we had in law school. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so uh, to follow up on that, Kim, when you talk about uh, relational practices task force, uh, and of course you're also a pioneer in integrative law. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit about uh, what, what, what is integrative law? How does relational practice, is relational practice the same thing? Um, how do all these concepts uh, that you teach uh, relate to each other? Um, and they're all pieces of a puzzle, I mean, mm -hmm. the short answer. Um, for me, integrative law is a larger, started, I was saying umbrella for a while, but I think it's more like the ground that things grow in. Mm -hmm. And that, um, and that, uh, Relational practices is part of integrative law, um, but it's also not everything. So I, when I wrote my book, I, my second book, Lawyers as Changemakers, mm -hmm. I put out a request for contributions to the book. And I didn't give much in the way of guidelines. I wanted to see what people thought integrative law was. And they were people that I recognized as integrative lawyers. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I asked them to write something, and I got the most amazing group of essays mm -hmm. and stories and exercises, and um, and so that's that's what's in the book. And so then I had stacks literally saying, well, this feels like this, and this feels like this, and this feels like this. And so there were four things that came up. Or first, first I saw that we were all reacting to a system that didn't work. Mm -hmm. And um, and then we started looking for how to make it work. And we started by figuring that there must be something wrong with us. So we started working on ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so there, there were things like mindfulness mm -hmm. and there were things like personal growth and wellness and, you know, all of that seemed to fall in this, what I called reflective practices mm -hmm. of you know, self-work. And as, as people started to look at themselves in the system, the next level of inquiry was about values. Mm -hmm. And, who, you know, like what are my values and what are the values of the legal system mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and purpose, you know, like what, what is the purpose of the law and what is my purpose in the law? Mm -hmm. And then, um, sometimes I say one first and sometimes I say the other, the, the next two kind of merge together, but um, it was a sense of a, of a level of consciousness <clears throat> and awareness that this inquiry, this self inquiry, the systemic inquiry actually um, led to a shift in consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, you know, again, I would say awareness about 
uh, one's place in the world and the system, um, which then is related to you know, looking at how can I be a person who makes a difference in a system. Mm -hmm. And so for me, those are the components of integrative laws, being able to integrate that and to say, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing my work. I, I know my values. I um, am working on my own consciousness and I am taking a systemic view of how, you know, how all that fits together and I'm integrating all of that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so that to me is what integrative law is. And so relational practices fits in there because it's, how, it's, it's a way we practice when we have, um, have been integrative. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and, you know, once we do that, I, my observation is we can't just be in the regular legal system anymore as a cog in that machine. We have to, we have to, by nature of how systems work, we're making change. Mm -hmm. Because when you are a member of a system and you change, it starts to change the system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I hope that made sense. Yes, yes, it does. And, and, and to follow up on that, on that question, I know you, you do, uh, you speak a lot at law schools and you uh, teach law students and, and, and law professors of uh, how to bring this into regular law school curriculum. And, and I'm wondering, how's it going uh, in, terms <laughs> of, uh, in terms of integrating, you know, bringing these uh, concepts and ideas into education and profession that I think traditionally has been quite conservative and quite resistant to um, change and to adopting new ways uh, of seeing things. Well, we were talking earlier about the, um, the levels of values. Mm -hmm. uh, and how blue is all about law and order and checking the boxes. Well, I think legal education is very firmly rooted in that value mm -hmm. system. And anybody who is trying to do anything different is extremely courageous. Mm -hmm. and, those, and there are people who are. Um, some 20 years ago, a group was formed called Humanizing Legal Education. Mm -hmm. And um, it's become a section of the AALS, the Academy of American Law Schools, which is the group that the accredited law schools belong to. Most of them, not all of them. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so the, um, there are many people who are uh, working really hard to change education against um, a system that doesn't want to change. And, and there have been a lot of reports. Um, uh, Carnegie and best practices, mm -hmm. a couple of best practices, um, studies that have made re re uh, recommendations about changes that law school should make that have gone uh, mostly unanswered. Mm -hmm. uh, but certain professors now have that as evidence of this is the way things would work better. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's some really brave people out there who are who are doing some really excellent work, and they're teaching things that um, were not offered when I was in law school, mm -hmm. and um, and and so, uh, yeah, I wish I could say I'm really optimistic, <laughs> but one of the things I've seen is that when things get tough for law schools, their first reaction is let's let's cut those programs because they're not necessary. Right. Right. Well, I know uh, we're coming towards uh, towards the end the end of our conversation, and as we come towards the end, um, I want to throw this at you. Uh, what you know, if you if you were queen for a day, uh, <laughs> and just and you could single handedly change um, the way we train lawyers in this country in the, in, in the United States, uh, what would you do? Well, this may sound really strange, but you won't be surprised that I would have, my first reaction would be a really strange one. I would teach art and law. Mm -hmm. um, because art incorporates so much of that inner work mm -hmm. and um, tapping the creativity. Um, I, and it's actually happening that uh, there's a lot going on with art and law. And in um, and Amsterdam at the, um, at the law school, they are teaching a course that design students and uh, law students are sharing 
mm. is forced to design the new legal system and the mm. new courthouse mm -hmm. based on um, like what a, what the design t students are bringing and the and the lawyers are inquiring into. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's I think that's key. And um, if you'd asked me five years ago, I might not have said that because I didn't consider myself much of a creative um, nor an artist. Uh, but the more I incorporate art in my training, the more results I see of lawyers really getting in touch with themselves. Mm. And, it, and I think that's really, really brilliant because when we start thinking in, of law in terms of design, uh, there is fluidity there, there is motion, yeah. um, you know, and, and, and then we can start getting away from that conditioning um, you know, of, of rigidity, of, of rules and rights um, and result-driven processes uh, and, and, and churning through clients. So I think that this is, this is quite deep and quite, quite brilliant. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Kim Wright. Thank you for, for joining me. Uh, of course, I think you and I can speak for hours. I, I imagine so. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, but I do know uh, that you have another commitment, and so I want to honor that. Uh, so thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here.